Welcome to UMC All Access Facebook Live. I'm Angelique Perrin. Really excited because as you know, June is Black Music Month, but tomorrow is Tupac's birthday. And it's also the debut of All Eyes on Me. Here at Urban Movie Channel, we are really excited. So excited that this week is Tupac Week. We are celebrating his life and his legacy with some great documentaries. Log on to urbanmoviechannel.com or go to umc.tv for Tupac Versus and Tupac Before I Wake. Um, also, don't let me forget, if you want a free subscription one year to umc.tv, all you have to do is log on today, right now, and play the Tupac Quiz. First 50 players to play, you get one year free. I am sitting here uh, with a very important person, okay? Tupac's first manager mentor, friend of many years. We are going to be taking Facebook Live questions, so make sure that you chime in whenever you have a question, because I'm going to be going right to my little iPad. I'm going to say your name and, and ask your question. But joining me, she is an industry legend, okay? She's worked for every record label you can think of, Atlantic, Sony, Def Jam. She met Tupac spring of 88 as he entered something that she calls a microphone session. So he was there writing poetry, spitting some rhymes, and uh, she's currently the manager of Earl Sweatshop. Welcome, welcome, Layla Steinberg. Thank you for coming. Thank you, thank you for having me. Okay, so I'm going to assume that you went to see the movie last night, All Eyes on Me. I wanna know, not everything, but what'd you think? Um, I did go see the movie, and I think it's really an important film. I think that it gives us an entry into this really complex, beautiful man, and there's no one movie that can tell his whole story, so I think that this is the beginning point. Okay, the beginning point. That sounds intriguing, Layla. Okay, so I'm excited. I know everybody else is excited, but for those who haven't seen the trailer, let's go ahead and take a little peek. You got to enter in somebody's world in order to lead them out. <clears throat> Money ain't a thing. What you need is guidance. You either with us or you against us. Don't let something you do for 50 seconds get you 50 years. You used to be damned. It's stupid and it's dangerous. Tomorrow ain't promised to no man. All eyes on me. Death Row's more than a label. It's a way of life. Rated R. Special previews Thursday night in theaters Friday. All right, we're here with Layla Steinberg, first manager for Tupac. This is UMC All Access. Um, Layla, you knew him very well. You saw the movie All Eyes on Me. What did you think of the way they portrayed your friend Tupac Shakur? I think that um, I think that everyone should see the movie. I support the movie. A lot of people have asked me, and people keep congratulating me. I didn't make the movie, you guys. I didn't even go. Um, but I will say, LT made such an effort to include all of us and I was working, I, I do manage a sweatshirt and I had a lot going on at the time so I wasn't able to go and I didn't participate but to his credit he wanted all of us to participate and it was such an impossible feat to get this movie done and the politics and all the pain that <clears throat> even me, I can't watch it objectively so I really went and I, I tried to remove my opinions and my role and just watch it. And I did leave a few times. It's hard for me to watch certain scenes in the movie because it's like you, I relive that time. But I think he really did the impossible and he got it done and no one else could do it. And so there's been so little cooperation from all of us, including myself, that the fact that he's a young black man and and he was inspired by Pac and I believe he's one of the brains that was sparked and I believe we should support young men who pursue dreams like he did and, and so for that I really I, I feel we should support LT 
And we should support this story coming out because even though all the facts aren't accurate, then it's our job to do what I'm doing today, which I'm uncomfortable. I'm always awkward for an interview. But I'm fine. more committed to this story coming to the surface and that he helped us start the difficult conversation. And, and I think the woman um, who played Afeni did a great job. I think Demetrius, who played Tupac, that was an impossible role. And for those of us who know and love Pac, it's so weird to see anyone. But he did a good job. You know, he could have grown into the role more. There was no time. So he had a good coach. Um, so there's a lot. You know, I could give a lot of details, which I'll do more as more people get to see it. But if you love Pac, support it because we need these stories told. And I'm only in it for a very small piece, you know, they introduce who I am in the story. But I'm thankful because a lot of people weren't in the story at all. And so it gives me an opportunity to tell all of you in more depth, you know, what those times were like, because there was a few years of deep struggle before we ever had a meeting. And it's like, oh, he came to workshop. I introduced him and we got a deal and it's never that way, you know. <laughs> so um, that's how much they showed of you in the movie? Well, it's, you know, he met a woman named Layla. He came to her workshop. She introduced him. And that's real. We did that, but it was way deeper. Okay. A lot more involved. Well, let's talk about the depth. <clears throat> he came from a Black Panther household. Your mom was an activist with Cesar Chavez. You both came together and wanted to change the world. Talk about finding that kindred spirit in him. I think that <clears throat> we came together in our pain. Um, I think that my mom had me young, my parents were young, my mom, um, she wanted to be active in any way she could. She wanted to belong, a lot like Pac's mom, and, um, and they wanted change. And my mom had me in 1961 at the onset of the 60s, and so my mom and dad took me to a lot of different music events, different marches, Elysian Park, you know, we were active here in LA. And so I, I was born into a family that questioned why we're here and, and not everyone's born and, and asked those questions. And so Pac and I shared the desire to say, what the heck is going on in this world? And what is with this imbalance? And why are we so messed up and hurting? And so we, we really shared a deep pain and a deep responsibility. And so for me, I started this workshop as a way to bring diverse artists. I wasn't a rapper and I never felt I should be rapping. I, um, I feel like we have to honor where art forms came from. And, and hip hop at the time in its inception was struggle music. It was all about transforming this pain and you know spirituals were were at a time that the the music at the time was um, not for the sake of music but for the sake of a code for the sake of fighting for freedom for um, having a code that most people didn't understand and so it was a way to fight for freedom without those that weren't supposed to know, knowing. And so hip hop was the same. Hip hop was an activist um, commitment to taking music and making a difference and making change. And so you have no right to enter this art form if you don't understand the responsibility and you're not accountable. And so I wanted to gather a group of young artists, myself included, to have difficult conversations with our art and take it out into the world. And so we were a small group. It was Ray Love and Kenyatta and Jacinta. And none of them were in the film, but they were all his sparring partners. They were his peers. And so we had this intention of taking this creative process and making changes. And the thing that Pac and I both would all the time say is, if we could figure out 
what was wrong with the world and, and in education, what will we change? Well, all of our hearts are messed up, whether you come from priv privilege or poverty, like we're damaged. We're all fragmented, broken families with the exception of a few. And then we don't understand finance or the management of money. And so we wanted to change the world, and we were young and dumb enough to believe we could do it. <laughs> like, everyone says, did you know? Yeah, I knew I was part of it. I, I not only knew, I felt like I didn't know the world was so big. I just thought Pac wanted to be the one. I believed he was. I approached supporting him like a campaign manager, and we were going to campaign for the top position, and we were going to take over and change education, change activism, and go from go from um, I lost my thought. Oh, we we were going to go from um, revolution to resolution, and. And we didn't see a lot of that. You know, revolution is going against a system. But once you revolt, then what do you do with it? And so we used to sit and have real discourse, which I don't see enough of now. But we would sit as, you know, I mean, I was like 25 with two kids and a third on the way. I was young, knew nothing about the business, but thought we could own the world, and that's how we approached it. And, and you did. Um, you did own the world, didn't you? I mean, microphone sessions, let's, let's talk about the first time you walked in there and what happened that turned you from a facilitator to a manager. So um, it wasn't called the mic sessions back then. It was just our poetry circle. It was a okay. gathering in my living room. I, I later, a few years later, I kept saying, you know, we all um, need to have a voice. And, and this is where we were developing our voice. So we were a small group in my living room. And I'd give a topic every week. And we'd all write together. And then we'd form assemblies and workshops out of our writing. And so Pot came... And within the second time of us gathering, it was like, well, why do you get to pick all the topics? And I was like, this is my thing. I did it. And he was like, y'all are crazy. Why you let her decide everything? So it was a, a funny dynamic. And even though he was like eight years younger than me, he was older than me in many ways. Right. And I, I mean, I look at footage of me back then. I was such a know-it-all. Excuse me, you guys, if you knew me 30 years ago. It, <laughs> I, I didn't really think I was a know-it-all, but I kind of came off like that because I just believed we could do this. And so, um, but it was all love. And so with Puck, he felt like I had great ideas and great topics, but he felt like he had great ones too. And so he shifted the dynamic. And I guess the only reason it wasn't a shared um, facilitation at the time is no one challenged me. Mm -hmm. And so Puck... He, um, he didn't just challenge me, he wanted to take over. You know, he was a nut. <laughs> and he, was, he, he loved power and I hated it. Um, I ran from it. Still to this day, you know, I'm okay now, but I still don't like a lot of the people that I've met along the way in positions of power. So because I dislike so many of the wealthiest people I've met, um, and those that hold the most power, and it's usually been white men. Um, and then I have biracial children, so it, it challenged my relationships in the world that looked like me. And at the time, I didn't understand a lot of what I understand now. But So Pac ended up really kind of becoming a partner in the process. And he helped me reframe my own teaching and... And then he was like, why are you so uncomfortable being in your power, Layla? You dope. And this is back then. I was like, huh? Um, so he was like, you're going to manage me. I'm going to manage you. I don't even like business. I love art. I love what we can do. I understood the power of the artist and that an artist that owns their power is more powerful than our president. And so that I got. And I wanted to develop that greatness, but management, I, I was like, you know, I, 
when people say, what do you want to do when you get older? My mom, beautiful woman, learned so much. I have my mother's heart, but she wasn't always an available parent. And she also had issues with self-worth, addiction. She was often not responsible in ways that you need to be when you decide to have children. So my father was my primary active parent, like Puck, whose mother was. But then the times, our generation, the crack epidemic. Um, and so with Puck, he was like, man, you would be perfect. And I'm an avid reader. I study everything. The one thing I did not want to study was the business of music and the business of management. And so in our early sessions, Ray Love had already appointed me as manager, and I was like, no, it's not happening. And Ray is Cab Calloway's grandson. Okay. And so he came from a musical family, and, and before Pac even came along, and you must know, Ray Love wrote the first song Tupac ever released. If you don't know Trapped was Ray Love's song, you need to know. And, and Ray actually... Um, was the first. You know, Pac came under Ray and got a lot of his influence and style from Ray. These are the things you won't know in the movie, right. but we need to know these things. We need to know where people's roots are, where they got their style from, their influence. And so Ray probably would have been the first because he was the one that really saw my ability to do business, but Ray's father paid me a private visit showed up at my house and said, if you work with my son, you are going to pay. We don't want to be in this business. It's a toxic, dirty business, wow. and I love my son. And if you don't listen to me, one day somebody's going to have influence over your children, and you're going to pay the cost. And so I was horrified, and I started pushing Ray away because mm -hmm. I knew that conversation I had with his dad, and I, um, I couldn't tell Ray about this private visit. And so I loved him and Pac and Damone and all of them dearly. And how could I choose? So I was like, y'all got to be a group. <laughs> and um, that's how Strictly Dope came to be is because I couldn't pick and choose, but I knew I wasn't allowed to help Ray. So if we slide him into a group, then um, it was a way to deal with it. And so, and Pac loved Ray, got so much from him, but it got more it got complicated because Ray's father, um, he loved his son so deeply he was going to run interference and make it very difficult. And it became so difficult that, um, and I was really just playing a role, never planned on continuing the manager. I love these guys. I had to pacify them. So Pac started giving everyone my number. I holler at my manager and people call, hey, you know this young man? We want to do a high school thing. We heard it's you. So I was like, oh my gosh. And then Pac kept sliding me the business of music books. And mm -hmm. so he'd sit down, he'd read about publishing, he'd read about all these things. So in essence, the discovery, we're just going to deconstruct the myth. Um, and it's not anyone who wrote the script's fault because they don't know this. But what you would want to know is Tupac and Ray discovered Layla. Um, they actually realize that, that I had a gift that I didn't see, and they trained me to represent them, always understanding that eventually I would come back to what I'm passionate about, and I would do it until I didn't have to quit every other day. People think, they have the nerve to think the Tupac got rid of me. Uh-uh. It's the opposite. I every day waited for the day I could ease my way out. <laughs> Because what I do is I'm like the bow, and I shoot the arrows into the world, and I set them free. And that's what I love. I love developing and taking you to that place and, and seeing you fly. Mm -hmm. That gets me high, to see a young person own their voice, overcome their, their pain and their trauma. That's the thing that Tupac and I understood is we are traumatized. There is not a person watching or in this room that hasn't had a dose of immense trauma wherever you come from. So we wanted the antidote. We wanted to really look at how we transform trauma right. and heal. And that was our connection is 
We wanted to heal all these broken children. We wanted to go get Brenda's baby because there's a bunch of Brenda's babies right. in this world. And so I serve Brenda's babies. I don't serve the system. I don't answer to a record label. I don't answer to those that run this shit. Like, I'm really, I, 25, 30 years, I still do the same thing every day, you guys. A juvenile hall, San Quentin prison, a kid in foster care, baby sleeping on my couch. Like, I do this. Um, it was never a joke to me. I could cry right now. That's why I left during certain scenes in the movie, because we lost so many lives. And that's why I'm here right now with you, is because if anything, this movie can help us have the conversation and understand that Tupac was here because he was hurt and because he wanted you to understand where he came from and that his whole life was devoted to making this world better and to bring balance and that everyone should be sitting at that table and, and have the opportunity to that same education and that didn't exist. So. I know I went on a tangent, but like, that's why I'm sitting here. Let's talk about um, your work <coughs> with Aim for the Heart, since we're talking about... Aimfortheheart.org, you guys. Thank you. <laughs> you know, you use art, you use poetry to help develop emotional literacy. You're talking about how traumatized we all are, how we're all broken um, in some ways. What is emotional literacy, and how do you go about teaching this to the uh, to the people who come to aim for the heart so the mind follows the heart if you got the heart you could take people anywhere and I that was the one thing I got from the time I was very young I always say I was um, sitting on this ugly shag rug I was in fifth grade ten years old um, I think 1971, Marvin Gaye's song, What's Coming On, What's Going, going on. on. I heard that song, that song, I was already well aware that the one place that I felt connected and accepted, that race didn't matter, was when a, a song ignited a room. We all transformed. And that particular song, Vietnam War, I'm a, a child of that time, and that song did something to me. And it, it made me understand what a song can do to a generation. And so for me, I wanted to, to do emotional work. Like my whole life, I wanted to do heart work. And what did that mean? What was that? Well, I realized we don't learn in schools what it is to feel, how to navigate feelings, how to manage feelings, and not just ourselves. How do we look around the room and know when someone's teetering or mm -hmm. who might like tear up a, a room or destroy a city or what happened yesterday at um, the golf course or, you know, how do we recognize those things? And having a father who's a criminal defense attorney, um, he was a public defender when I was very young. How do you affect a courtroom, sway a jury? Uh, how do you fight for a child? Um, so all these questions, and that's where it all started. And so emotional literacy is being literate in feelings and, and group feelings and room feelings. And so I began to create a process to right. do that. And and art is so much easier because you have a room, you have a topic like race or violence, and we all talk, it could get pretty heated, but you have young people put it in a photo, a song, bring in a piece and let the piece tell the story. We begin to have solidarity. We begin to bond in a different way. And so I began to test the work out in a lot of the gang units and the juvenile halls. And, and I began to see enemies somehow finding points of unity through song and through music. And, and so now, 30 years later, I see the power of the work. I see our ability to transform rooms and cities and countries. And so Pac is my partner even more today 
because the work is really alive today and I use his songs in my curriculum and he used to say, Layla, I got you. Every song I give you is curriculum. And 20 years later, I got it and I was like, man, he knew my work better than me and he set me up. And um, so, yeah, so I still have the organization. I still do the work. I'm still in San Quentin working with Lonnie Morris and Wall Street. If you... Um, if you go to the website, though, you can see the interviews and the work in, in a deeper way. Um, I want to go to some questions, see if we can get to, let's see what we have here. By the way, UMC, Facebook Live, Tupac's first manager, Talicia um, is her name. She wants to know what were some of the things Pac wanted to do, some of the things on his agenda that he didn't get done. Hi, Talicia. He had a lot he wanted to get done, and it's what people do when you don't see them that's the most significant. Um, he gave so much. People don't know how much he supported my organization. I only stayed involved in his business until the early 90s. But then he came, he kind of pressured me to continue working with Ray. I, want, I never wanted to manage, so I was always looking for the escape. And Pac was like, oh, you don't get to leave. And so then I began to manage Mac Mall and Young Lay. Tupac directed their videos. I don't know if people knew he was an amazing director and that he directed videos for us. He had incredible programs he wanted to do with young women. I mean, we had a lot of plans. That's why I'm still doing the work. I'm part of the plan. Um, I was in Pac's life until I was supposed to be in Vegas that night with Tracy celebrating her birthday and going to the party. I... Um, I was always clear I wasn't supposed to stay in management, but he always wanted me right there. That's why it's so tragic that the estate has not handled his legacy well. Let's talk about that. I mean, we've had so many high-profile celebrity deaths lately, and we've seen how things have been managed and mismanaged. Um, can you talk about your feelings about yeah, I haven't talked about it at all. You know, I've never, I've sat quiet for 20 years. That's probably why I'm not as present in the movie or the story. I've cut my own voice off because I was so hurt. And when Pac passed away, you know, those of us who loved him, we weren't so functional. And so I find it really interesting, the, the term gatekeeper. Anyone that identifies themselves as the the keeper of the gate, you know, be wary, you guys. Think about it. So there was um, someone, I, I'm not even going to mention names. I don't need to do your research. You guys, when you look at um, legacy and you look at an estate, a Faney was a grieving mom. I didn't get to see a Faney for years because the gatekeepers kept her away. So... First of all, I'm a horrible reminder of the most painful part in her life. I get it. I have the same um, dynamics with loved ones in my family. So I understand when you're in a really horrible place and then there are people who come. I was there for her son in the most crucial time. Nobody in Pac's family cannot have love for me. Like, I love Pac. I devoted myself to this young man for years. And so what happened was people who weren't involved, from lawyers to the gatekeepers, they weren't in Pac's life like that. But they came in and you got a mom that's hurting and she trusts people to manage his estate and his legacy. And it was mismanaged. It's my first time talking about it, so I'll let you know. It was mismanaged. Everybody that loved Pac and was close to him was cut out. They weren't considered. You've got an entire community of people who love Tupac grieving, broken, and cut out. And the keeper of the gate kept a Faney isolated. There are stories about me that are not true. So ask me. I, there's nothing I won't answer. And so... 
for 20 years we couldn't all sit in a room together and be together? No, we couldn't because those people, if our voices were heard, then his feelings would have had to be taken in consideration. Do you think he wanted all those songs changed? People who wrote with him cut out? No, he didn't. So um, it's painful to see that. And so thank you for giving me a platform. Thank you, LT, for not cutting me out of the story because if it was up to the people who control the narrative, how can you not include somebody who was there from the beginning who risked their life, not just their comfort. We were in shootouts. We risked our lives and put our children in jeopardy for this legacy, and you're going to make us irrelevant. It doesn't work that way, baby. We are here, and yes, we paid we some dues, and I am ready to talk about it. Talking to <laughs> Layla Steinberg, uh, Tupac's first manager, mentor, and friend. We are taking questions on Facebook Live, so let me go to another one. Um, this is from Eric. He said, what do you think of the state of hip-hop today? Do you think Tupac's generation was the best, and will it ever be beaten? Good question, Eric. You said, <laughs> will it ever? No. It will never. Pac is the best to me. I'm um, 55. I still bump Tupac all the time. Nobody could touch Tupac to me. And that doesn't take away from my love for, for those on the East. You know, that hurt. I love Biggie, too. I... Um, would like to, to shift responsibility for what happened. You know, and now I'm an elder. Those that were in a position to help facilitate healthy relationship didn't. That shouldn't have happened. And so that, that was really painful to see all these close friends we, fall apart. Are we talking about the East Coast, West yes, Coast Yes, that thing. pissed me off. It really hurt. We, that shouldn't have been allowed to escalate. Was it real? Was it manufactured? I mean, because it was always said that, Things oh... Things become real right. when they're manufactured, and we become what we want to save. And you surround yourself with violence. Violence, it permeates your being. You surround yourself with dysfunction. You begin to not function. Tupac's essence, his commitment, and his plan was always the same. But the noise and the toxic people and those around, you know, misery loves company and misery wants to bring you down. And so that's the part that hurts so much. But no, you know, that is, Pac is one of a kind. I got more coming for you guys, though. <laughs> uh oh. Um, Elisa wants to know do you think any artist today feeds off of Tupac's music? Oh, I mean, Eric Kendrick feeds off of Pac's music. He lets you know it's a gang of artists that feed off Pac's music. There's a new generation. I don't like when people say what happened to, to the good music. It's all around you. Do some work. There is all kinds of amazing art out there. And Pac loved, I mean, he hardly listened to rap. That's the crazy thing. Pac loved classical music. He loved incredible plays. He loved Wyndham Hill artists, you know, some of the great guitarists and piano players. He knew more classical music than me. Um, so he, he loved to explore things that, that made him uncomfortable too. And so go read you guys, listen to some other artists. I got a list that I can tell you. Well, speaking of uh, the future generation of artists, you continue working with up and coming artists. Um, and I know a lot of aspiring rappers and singers want to know, what do you look for? What makes you decide, ooh, that's the one I want to spend sun up to sundown with for the for next? Artists, okay. Guys. I never look for anyone in my life. It's those that wouldn't let me walk away that I ended up working with. They, I don't discover them. They discover me and force okay. me. Like I have um, Fauna, Fauna Noise, you guys. She took most of the stuff off, but her new record is coming. But like, if you were to say, whose project am I the most excited about right now? It's her birthday today. She's in the other room, but she's a young Gemini. She, um, you know, her birthday's today. Pac is tomorrow. She's the one who 
pressured me to come back in the business. She, I knew her, she used to come to my workshop when she was a little girl. And about six years ago, she came back and said, you know you're going to manage me. I was like, Fauna, you know I'm not managing anymore. And so she pressured me so much that I ended up in a situation where I was working with Earl Sweatshirt. No plan to manage him per se, but he was in a circumstance that, you know, I always gravitate towards young, brilliant minds that just need a little facilitation. And he was in a, a situation where I was able to, to play a role in his life. And he's family now. I love him. He has me until the end of time. I won't always handle business for him, you know, but I'll always be there. But it's because of Fauna that I ended up really working with Earl. And, and now Fauna's record is coming. And she booked her first film, Jodie yeah. Foster movie. I'm super <laughs> excited. So... You know, they find me, but I still okay. teach workshop every Wednesday. We got another workshop in Long Beach. I, I'm training other people now to facilitate. So I have a training coming in July if people want to go to the website. And so I'm training people to facilitate the work and do the work. And then in August, I'm going to do a seminar for people who want to manage. Because mm. I just want to hand you all the work. <laughs> and, and I want to... Um, by the time I'm 60, I'm going to go right full-time. That's my plan. I got this plan, so please, God, keep me here so, so I can get my, um, my stuff finished. <laughs> so um, let's talk about the workshop, Microphone Sessions. You walk in, there's a theme, today's theme is whatever. How does it work? What happens? What happens when someone comes in and has this big emotional burst? Because it's poetry, so it's no telling what's going to happen when you write or when you deliver it. That, How does it all work? It's, um, that's why I have a training coming, so you can learn how to facilitate. But it's true. It's a very emotional space. It's like therapy. We're an alternative to people who go to NA meetings and CA meetings or codependent or not, whatever it is. We're a space that serves community service hours. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, so, yeah, we, um, we're a multifunctional space for many different needs, but facilitation is a different gift. And you got to know you open a room up, you got to be able to have closure. You can't let someone who poured their heart out walk away and not know. And that's why I want to train teachers, because teachers have the next generation in the palm of their hands. So how do you turn on the light bulbs of 30 kids in your fourth grade class and let a room know you all have it? You are it. And the thing is, you... um. You turn the light bulb on and you lead children to their destiny. Okay. And, so. and you're still, you still do it on a regular basis? Yeah, I still do like the people, work every people, day. People <laughs> show up and they read their poetry? Hey. Are, there, are, are there rules? What are the rules? Well, you guys got got to come and find out all that. <laughs> go to the website. I'm coming. <laughs> I'll be there. Okay, um, let's go to John, who wants to know what was Pac's favorite song. Oh my gosh, you know, I'd say um, that he was playing a lot of Seal before he died, a lot of Sting, um, Michelle and Degiacello at that particular time. He was like, you up on Michelle, Joan Armatrading. If you don't know Joan Armatrading, you should know her. I mean, he just had strange, diverse taste. Elvis Costello. Who would think Tupac is bumping Elvis Costello? <laughs> but he was Joe Jackson. Now, of course, he loved all the greats, but I'm trying to give you some outside-the-box stuff. Who would think he's going to be playing Joni Mitchell in the morning? But he was. Um, so, yeah, always had some Stevie in there, some Earth, Wind, and Fire. We listen to Eric. Sun up to sundown and all in between, the music was our relationship and, and the search for artists that could change generations. You know, you were talking about the legacy earlier, and I'll be honest, I was always very uncomfortable with the number of Tupac releases that came after his death. After the first one, I'm like, all right, that's good, but then more and more and more. But Travis wants to know, get to his question, will there be more music released from Tupac's fault? 
Yeah, he was a workaholic. Um, I shocked G on the red carpet. I heard him say yesterday there was nobody. Money B, too. We didn't ever know anyone that worked like Pac. He worked with desperation. He worked with an understanding that he wouldn't be here. He was the greatest diagnosis of our generation, but didn't get to be here for the solution or the resolution. He expected us to do that. Um, that's why the estate should be working with us. They should be committed to the work, to the legacy, to what it, no one does it in a vacuum. It wasn't all about Tupac. It was about the collective. He knew that, y'all should know that. And so um, with that, it was how do we transform large masses? It's critical mass. How does a song go viral now? Back then we didn't have viral. So now how do we do that and have that massive reach? And so I would suggest that you all um, study his work ethic and know that he was crazy. Workaholic, nuts. Um, let's see, Talicia again, she wants to know, we're going back to this Tupac Biggie thing, um, how and why did the Biggie Pac rivalry become so complicated when they were both tops of their respective coasts and known to be close friends at one time? It came, became massive because, of, that's what I was saying earlier, because it served other people. The conflict served others, not them. And so it's always the people on the sidelines that escalate stuff or the friend that's not really the friend mm -hmm. or you got to look at who benefits from a crisis or a conflict and then you have your answers. Are you going to answer it or are you going to let us think and ponder? Are you going to tell us who was behind it? Well, Come there, on, there's Layla. so many factors that I right. can't tell you, but I, sure. I can tell you that those that we point the finger at her are not the ones and it didn't serve them mm -hmm. so did you work to put them back together did you I didn't get a chance mm -hmm. it it was one thing happened that's another thing you gotta know you've got those voices inside that tell you when not to do stuff um, there's also lines once you cross you can't go back right I love Tupac so I could tell you the truth he made a lot of bad choices so did I. We blew it. Um, can we tell you that we screwed up and we didn't always do the best thing? So, um, so he, he made some choices. He crossed some lines you can't go back from. Mm -hmm. We can't put him on a pedestal. We have to know Tupac is a human being. He was a man and, and he was a brilliant man with flaws and, and so, by putting him on a pedestal, we don't learn the lesson. Take him off the pedestal, let him sit next to you, learn the lesson so we don't repeat it. Now, when Tupac died, we lost a rapper, a, a leader, a voice. Who did you lose? I lost a best friend. I lost a family member. Um, Pac is still with me every day, you know? So I lost a loved one. and. His voice matters to me. It's why I'm going to start talking, and I stayed silent for too long. I'm kind of mad at myself. I didn't use my voice. I didn't even participate in the film when they asked me to go to Atlanta. I was always worried about hurting someone's feelings or a Fanny might not approve, and now she's gone. Look what I did. I silenced myself because I never got to talk to her. I kept setting up meetings, and the people around her interfere. They ran interference. I never got to sit and give her a hug and tell her how sorry I was. She lost her son. She shouldn't have been responsible for all these narratives. It's not fair. We can't do that to someone. So we have to hold other people responsible. Thank you, Layla, so much. Was that an hour? <laughs> I don't know, but boy, you gave us a whole bunch. And of course, right. you can follow. You were great. Um, you can find Layla at aimfortheheart.org. I'm looking forward to seeing the movie. And thank you so much for sharing so much of yourself and answering the questions and being candid and, and giving us a little bit of perspective. Well, thank you guys. Thank, thank you for you. having me. I hope this was okay. And happy birthday to Tupac, which is tomorrow. Um, if you're not already a UMC subscriber, go right now to UNC 
dot TV. Don't forget, we are doing a two-pot quiz. It starts today. First 50 players get one year free of UNC.TV. So go enjoy. Go see the movie. Make sure you check out our documentaries on Tupac as well. And that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you. Are you is she still on? <laughs> Layla, thank you so much. I'm Angelique Perrin, and uh, we appreciate your time. UNC.TV. Check out the documentaries and go see the movie. She said it's good. Believe her. <laughs>